Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast, and welcome to our fabulous new media suite. Apologies if the audio is a bit echoey, it's still a work in progress, but we're really excited about this new setup, and it's going to be where we'll record all of our episodes going forward. This is the second in a series of episodes about Lenin as part of the year of Lenin to mark the centenary of the great revolutionaries passing. A couple of weeks ago, we had Rob Sewell, author, along with Alan Woods, of a new biography, In Defense of Lenin. Really excellent. I'll put a link in the description to where you can buy a copy. But today, we're very excited to have with us Fiona Lally, who is a leading comrade with soon-to-be-the-revolutionary Communist Party, the RCP, the British Communist. Fiona, thanks so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you for having me on this special episode. So we want to talk about the lies, myths and slanders thrown at Lenin. We're going to deal with them. We're going to debunk them. We've been asking for our listeners and readers to send in myths they've heard about Lenin or questions they have about Lenin via our website, a new website we've launched for the Lenin year, Lenin.red. We'll deal with some of those. Thank you very much if you sent one in. But Fiona, just to kick us off, I wonder if you could give me your opinion about why you feel the bourgeois regard it as so important that Lenin's name be blackened in the annals of history? Yeah, I think this is a really important question to start with because the bourgeois really go to immense lengths uh, to shape public opinion, public understanding when it comes to Lenin in particular, the Russian Revolution as a whole, but precisely Lenin. In fact, before we did this podcast, um, I mentioned to Joe that I wanted to look up in textbooks in school how mm. Lenin is spoken about, how he's taught about, because you can study the Russian Revolution um, in history for A-level AS. In yeah, I did, actually. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, and there's one textbook that we found, and just one of the chapter titles for that you know section of the subject, Project. Uh, I have it here in front of me. It's called The Consolidation of the Communist Dictatorship. You have a hard, you have a hard copy there, don't you? Just yes. hold, hold it up for our uh, viewers on YouTube. <laughs> so it's The Consolidation of the Communist Dictatorship, and that's looking at the Bolsheviks in power from 1918 to 1924, mm -hmm. which is an important time that you know we also pay a lot of attention to, um, uh, and which we can talk about a bit later on in the podcast, perhaps. What did the Bolsheviks actually do when they were in power? But this is just a small example of how important it is for them to sully the name of Lenin. And let's get into why it is they do that, right? That's what we're here to answer today. And I think it's because, look, the Russian Revolution and Lenin was instrumental to it. The mm. Russian Revolution changed the world. And what do I mean by that? Like, that's, that's a huge statement. I mean that when the Bolsheviks came to power and, and the worker state was decreed, this was like a beacon of light or an electric bolt of lightning that was being shone upon this state. And, and that was being looked to by workers and the oppressed all over the world. They were looking at this new state, which was a state unlike any other state that existed. Right, and inspired a wave of revolutionary struggle in other countries as well, you know, in, yes. in Italy, in... Uh, Bavaria, in Hungary. It was a few years later, but in 1926 in Britain, you had the general strike, which was yeah. a an aftershock, if you like, of the Russian Revolution in some respects. Yeah. Im like immediately after the Russian Revolution, almost, these processes began to take place in all these other countries that you've mentioned. And we have to think, I mean, imagine we're in 1917, the, the, there's a world war taking place. Mm. And in the midst of all of that slaughter, millions of people dying, these workers in Russia rise up. And not only do they rise up and begin to actually take control of, of, of their lives for themselves, implement workers' control, expel the capitalists, expel the landlords, but they create an international organization that then says, then appeals to all of the oppressed all over the world and says, now you must do this too. And actually, we want to actively help you do that. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, Lenin, when he set up the Communist International, the Third International or the Comintern, he said that it was supposed to be a school of revolutionary communism. It was a means not only to organize the communists throughout the world to overthrow mm -hmm. their respective ruling classes and build communism in their own countries, but to educate the workers, the advanced layers of workers in those countries in yes. 
the example of the Russian Revolution, yes, but also in the ideas that lay behind the Russian Revolution, the Marxist ideas that were its bedrock. Yeah, exactly. And look, Lenin and and, and the Bolsheviks by extension and, and the Communist International, they were proving in practice i mean they inspired i know in in particular about how they inspired black radicals all over the world particularly in america that began looking to the bolsheviks um and and lenin as examples of how you actively fight racism and oppression and for the colonial world in particular lenin becomes this emblem Mm. of of fighting colonialism and fighting imperialism remains that way in the eyes of many people in the um, colonial world absolutely and then and it's not just a I want to really emphasize that this isn't just a symbolic, aesthetic thing that only happened in terms of words. The actual program of the Bolsheviks gave the right of self-determination for all of the oppressed nations within the Tsarist Empire. Um, One of the first acts or part of the acts of of the Bolsheviks in power was to liberate some of the territories that the Tsar had Um, taken from China, Mm. that was a big impetus to Chinese youth and workers looking again to Bolshevism and and setting up their own Chinese communist Yeah, I mean, the right to self-determination was amongst the reforms that were initiated immediately by the new Soviet regime after power was taken in 1917. Yeah, and so the, the point is, Lenin, what this state, this brand new young state did was it demonstrated so concretely that there is an alternative to to capitalism. Um, It's not a utopian, fanciful idea. Um, It showed we can do this, and and in fact, we're going to help you. And so for the bourgeois at the time, Mm. which we can come on to cover, they thought, okay, we can't can't, just let this slide. But today they can't let it slide because all of the same problems and contradict capitalism obviously remains with us. And so they go to a lot of effort to, yeah, to denigrate Lenin and, and, and the Bolsheviks and what they, what they began to build in Russia. And that's the point, really, isn't it? The reason that the capitalists and their apologists can never forgive Lenin is because he was at the head of a party that fought them and won yeah. and held on to power. I mean, the Paris Commune was the first attempt to establish a workers' government, but of course it was drowned in blood. Mm. The Russian Revolution held power. It expropriated the capitalists and it... Mm put the reins of political power in the hands of ordinary workers and peasants. And for that reason, Lenin can never be forgiven. And his example can't be allowed to catch on or to inspire future generations, although that's happening regardless. Funny, I also gave this textbook a read. It took me back, actually, because mm-hmm. as I said, I, I did an AS level, an A level in history. Mm-hmm. And I chuckled reading this little profile they have. They have a pull out picture of Lenin with a little profile and it says that he had a harsh and uncompromising attitude uh, that led the Social Democrats to split in 1903 into the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. I mean, Rob and Alan cover this in the book. If you actually read the history of the 1903 conference, mm. Lenin was extremely patient. He was unfailingly democratic. And it was the Mensheviks, the minority, who acted in a terribly anti-democratic way, by the by. But later on, they sa- they saved the really slanderous stuff for later in the text. I guess you have to learn about the history and you have to go through a few lessons before you're allowed to really um, get at the um, the big dramatic conclusions. Yeah. They write, for Stalin's enemies like Trotsky, Stalin turned the USSR into a perversion of what was intended to be the first worker state. However, this is too simple an explanation. Lenin was a ruthless leader. Some apologists have excused the uh, excesses under Lenin, such as the Red Terror, I think they're talking about us, as a response (laughs) to the desperate situation in which Russia found itself after the revolution. Stalin's excesses, especially the widespread purges, seem far less excusable by comparison. However, Lenin signed death warrants with as little thought as Stalin. And I'm glad that the authors of this textbook were able to look into Lenin's soul and (laughs) determine that he had as little regard for um, signing away people's lives as Stalin did. But um, I think that it's really worth underlining that this is a textbook for a state school history course. Mm -hmm. This is a textbook that will find its way into the hands of children at schools paid for with taxpayer money Um, and it's nothing short of slanderous anti-bolshevik anti-lenin propaganda yeah simple as that yeah 
yes, this is absolutely state propaganda and it's very nauseating to read um, from the perspective of the British state, which likes to think of itself as an upholder of democracy, freedom of speech, um, and, you know, uh, benevolent force over the world when it's the complete opposite. Um, and, and actually, ironically, that is what Lenin represented and the Bolsheviks. And so this is, yes. Yeah, we could equally ask the British ruling class how much regards they had when they were condemning the poor of Bengal to starve to death or they were... Yes, exactly cramming Africans into slave barges and so on. Now, mm -hmm. we're going to deal with the myths that we've been sent. The first of which is, was Lenin a dictator? And I think there's, there's two ways that you could present this. On the one hand, there's the way that Lenin's characterized by the bourgeois as this brutal, hard head of this anti-democratic regime who didn't broach any kind of dissent or opposition. But then there's also the... Um, way that Lenin is sometimes presented by the Stalinists, by mm -hmm. sections of the so-called communist movement, who caricature Lenin as a bit of a, a hard, heart, heartless party man. Mm. Um, and that's what really defined him, the fact that he was this sort of ruthless pragmatist and that, mm. who, who could get the job done. And Rob deals with this mischaracterization in the book. But um, what would you say to this, Fiona? Was Lenin a dictator? No. <laughs> okay, well, there Surprise. we go, episode over. <laughs> and I really want <laughs> to recommend um, the book for this that illuminates how Lenin was an outstanding um, figure from, from history uh, and a hero and a fighter of, of, of the working class. There's no doubt about that, but he was also a human being. Um, and the book really brings that forward. But look, when the bourgeois or, or even the Stalinists, whatever it is, try and present him as a dictator... There's two main planes on which they do it. One is through how the Bolshevik party was formed and the role that Lenin played within that. And the fact that Lenin was unapologetic in his insistence on class independence and doing whatever was necessary to further the interests of, of the working class and the peasantry in Russia. And what do I mean by that? Lenin had a program that he defended, oftentimes in a minority of, of one, mm. just himself. But it was precisely because the Bolshevik party had actually a very healthy culture of discussion internally um, within the, the party that he was able to, over a, a long period in certain circumstances, patiently convince all of the, the, the members that he needed to until they were won over to his ideas. And that took place all the way up until the October Revolution. Um, all through the course of that year, Lenin had to convince and, and argue for his position in terms of when the workers should actually take power, should they support the provisional government mm. that sprung up after the fall of, of, of the, the Tsarist. In fact, the Bolshevik um, newspaper Pravda, its editorial board, which mm. at the time was led by Kamenev um, and Stalin, mm. refused to publish Lenin's articles yes. on the run-up to the insurrection because yeah. Lenin was calling for an intransient attitude to the bourgeois provisional government of Kerensky and was calling for the workers to take power. Yeah. And that was seen as such a scandalous position, even by these leading figures within the Bolshevik party, that Lenin's articles were censored. And this goes to show Lenin had a huge amount of personal and political prestige he absolutely could have wielded that to a greater extent to mm -hmm. get his way by force but he didn't he patiently explained his position and he brought the party around yes exactly in fact this presentation of lenin as though he was able to just dictate whatever he wanted and the Bolsheviks immediately followed suit is completely categorically false. I mean, people joke about the fact that Lenin didn't have a lot of hair towards yeah. the end of his life and it's precisely because he, he was pulling his hair out. out. Yeah, constantly having to convince and write to the Bolsheviks and correct the Bolsheviks. Um, and he's able to do so not just through um, brutal commandism or bullying or this kind of magical personality that uh, the ruling class tried to present. But it, it's through the conviction of his political arguments that he that he puts forward. And he and he does inject, you know, talking specifically about the, the role he played in 1917 when he encourages the, the, the Bolsheviks to, you know, put forward this slogan of all power to the Soviets. He's mm -hmm. What he does is he injects the Bolsheviks with the confidence that they needed um, in order to, to take the struggle forward. 
And, and this brings us on to the second, almost more important aspect as to why Lenin is accused of being a dictator. It's because of what the Bolsheviks were able to do in power, which is that they were unapologetic in fighting for the interests of the workers, of our class, in the same way that the ruling class are unapologetic in fighting for their own interests. So much so that when the Bolsheviks took power, um, went to great lengths to bring that government down and, and bring the workers' state to its knees. That is what they can't forgive. And that is why they have to say, this man is a dictator and everything he represented was was evil and wrong. And it's an aberration um, of, of also Russian history that he was able to, to gain power. And they like to pretend that a perfect liberal democracy would have actually been in place um, um, had the October Revolution not happened. And let's talk a little bit about what the Bolsheviks actually did from power. Some of the founding policies of the Soviet Republic Equality for men and women before the law, mm-hmm. decriminalization of homosexuality, mm-hmm. bringing Russia out of World War One, so yes. ending their participation in that imperialist slaughterhouse, yeah. um, offering the right of self-determination to the oppressed nationalities in the sphere of Russian czarism. Yes. Um, land to the peasants, yes. so parceling out land to the peasants, doing away with um, the yoke of landlordism. Uh, expropriating the capitalists and establishing the foundations of workers' control of industry. I think that one thing we can say about the shock that the bourgeois at the time and the fury that they have today about Lenin's legacy and power is that the Bolsheviks actually carried out their program. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many politicians can you say that about? (laughs) This this term that we use dictatorship of the proletariat Mm. it's a term from an earlier time in a sense but really it just means workers power i mean Mm. if it's a dictatorship of the vast majority of people which today the working class is then that's real democracy that's Mm. quite the opposite of a dictatorship as it's understood in modern parlance whereas what you have in most capitalist countries um, they control the banks, they control the media, they control the army, they control the state. The rich, the bourgeois class are a dictatorship. Yes. They're a minority parasitic class that runs society in their own interests and they're willing to go to frightful lengths to maintain that power mm-hmm. from exacting police brutality against protesters to stripping away the rights of the working class to strike and organize through to launching wars to defend their interests abroad. So who's the real dictator? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, even just going back to the what you were saying at the start of that, which is you just listed um, what the Bolsheviks immediately um, did when they were in power. If we were to have a a balance sheet mm. <laughs> of of the first couple of years of the Bolsheviks in power to kind of any capitalist um, state today, especially today when we're in deep crisis of capitalism, where conditions are moving backwards for, for all workers all over the world. The Bolsheviks um, did far more in in on an economic level, on a social level, I think it's really important. Some of the things you mentioned in terms of um, the beginnings of equality between men and women, the right to divorce, the right to abortion, mm. which is being attacked by capitalist states all over the world. The end today. of legal discrimination against illegitimate children as well. Yes, there's there's so many, do- and they did all of this as well as immediately, by the way, nationalizing the banks and starting to to focus on key areas of industry that they had to take control over that the capitalists tried really hard to maintain. They did all of that in the midst of a civil war, yes. um, which was funded and promoted and military aid and, and, and armies were provided by um, the bourgeois all over the world to fight against the Bolsheviks and try and bring them down. 21 foreign armies um, to try and destroy the, the, the young worker state in, 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 in its very beginnings. And we'll get to the civil war um, in more detail in a moment, because it's pertinent to the next myth I want to deal with. But just mm. Finally, on this question of dictatorship versus democracy, what was the seat of political power in revolutionary Russia? It was the Soviets. Mm. What were the Soviets? Soviet is the Russian word for council. These were mass workers' councils. Mm. They were the most democratic form of government that has ever existed. They were a form of direct participation by ordinary people in the management of their lives and the economy. By comparison, what you have in Great Britain today, this bastion (laughs) of bourgeois democracy, we've got an election coming up this year Mm -hmm. where you get to choose between 
uh, Rishi Sunak, who supports capitalism, British imperialism, and opposes the organized working class. And you have Keir Starmer, who supports capitalism, imperialism, mm-hmm. and opposes the organized working class. You have a choice between effectively the same two politicians wearing different ties. And we're supposed to believe that this is more democratic than what the Russian workers and peasants were able to establish under the Bolsheviks after 1917. Yeah, it's a joke. The What we have to say is that the Bolsheviks in power and, and, and the early years of the Bolshevik state are the most democratic state um, that has ever existed. And that's precisely because of this element of workers' control that you know they, they implemented first in forms of encouraging the workers to take control of their factories um, or take control of their workplaces and not wait for the perfect moment or perfect Mm. situation in order to do so. But also in terms of the state itself, the right of recall for elected positions inspired by the Paris Commune, the average salary of of people who worked in, in the state, which was to, which was made the same as an average skilled worker. I mean, Lenin and Trotsky and the leading Bolsheviks led very humble, modest lives mm. um, to set an important tone in, in the government and in the state itself as to what they were supposed to represent and what they did represent. Yeah, um, no expenses scandals in the um, <laughs> first years of the Soviet yeah, Republic. Big ducks or whatever. Or chandeliers, whatever it was. <laughs> I that, think there was uh, a big floating duck. There was duck. a big floating okay. duck, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, that will probably resonate a bit more with our British <laughs> yeah. viewers. And that leads nicely into our second myth, mm-hmm. which is Lenin and the USSR were responsible for 100 million deaths. Sometimes it's more than that, sometimes it's 500 million, yes. 200 trillion. Who knows? They this killed every human being ever, ever born before 1917. Something like that, including today. Yeah, yeah no, Lenin's I... having a throne of skulls. Yeah, so this figure comes from the Black Book of Communism, um, which is this this book, a product of researchers, um, the methodology of which has been questioned. Uh, but it's not the point. that The first thing you know we should say in response to this is that we'll take... No lectures, uh, no commentary, no fake um, tears on on deaths or or victims of any kind of massacres or whatever it is from the bourgeois in Mm. in any capacity. I mean, the capitalist system is responsible for untold hundreds of millions of deaths that, you know, if if we want to quantify it, which is a kind of gross, crass way that is kind of impossible um, to as a balance sheet of, of different forms of regimes, then capitalism uh, is far worse. Yeah, to be clear, we aren't going to do that. But if we were to do way, that, the capitalists, yes. the imperialists yes. would far outstrip even the most generous estimates of the number of deaths under every worker state ever to have existed. Yes, yeah. Um, and it's 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 disgusting to even uh, for them to even try and use that as an well, argument. The Russian Revolution happened at the First World War. Yes. So this yeah. <laughs> this meat grinder in the heart of Europe created by capitalist imperialism. Exactly. And then you have a workers' government come to power, stop their involvement in that war, and and how does the bourgeois internationally respond to invade that state with yep. twenty one foreign armies and and help fund um the old. Uh, czarist uh, officials, regime supporters to fund their army, which was known as as the whites. And the reason, you know, it's often talked about the red army, and you know, and mm-hmm. against the whites, and that's because white was the color was associated with the with the czar. Um, in case people don't know about that. But yeah, the point is, a civil war did take place, which was a brutal um, war. The fault of that lies 100% with the with the bourgeois and with the counter-revolutionary forces that were trying to to attack the the government. Um, and and the Red Army was a an incredible army that was that was headed off that was headed by Trotsky. Um, Trotsky was the commander in chief of the Red Army, mm-hmm. made up of brave workers and, and peasants who joined the Red Army to defend their revolution and defend their state and defend the program that the Bolsheviks were trying to And they to won, implement. as a matter of fact. Exactly. Um, so the, the first thing to, to talk about when it comes to so deaths under the USSR is that the blame lies with the, with the bourgeois and the counter-revolution. I think we should also point to the sheer hypocrisy of the bourgeois today lecturing communists about the blood in our history, while as we speak, there is a war of ethnic cleansing being Mm. conducted by Israel, Mm. the so-called only democracy in the Middle East, Mm. Key West and ally against the Palestinians in Gaza, um, that 
all of the governments of the West support, they abet, they aid, they arm. So we will broach no moralism from these characters when it comes to bloodshed and mayhem. So just to return to the Civil War, this is always fertile ground for criticisms of Lenin. Obviously, it was a period where you saw war communism, the forceful requisition of peasants' grain in order to feed the cities and to maintain the defense of the Soviet Republic. Um, it's where you saw the Red Terror in response to the counter-revolutionary White Terror, mm. which began first and was far worse. Um, but I think we need to put this in context. As you say, this was a desperate moment for the revolution where Lenin, the Bolsheviks, and all of the workers and peasants of Russia were undergoing immense sacrifices in a life-or-death struggle mm. to protect their revolution. And actually, this comes across in Rob's book as well, there was international solidarity from the working class in Britain, in America, mm -hmm. and elsewhere. There were campaigns like Hands Off Russia, where workers in trade unions and workers' parties in the West said of their governments, this is a crime, this mm -hmm. is inexcusable. These are ordinary working people, just like us, who are standing up to defend themselves, and we're supporting the czarist autocrats they've just thrown out. I mean, mm. the White Army was led by not nice liberal Democrats, but people like Kolchak and Denikin, these mm. brutal proto-fascist, anti-Semitic, mass-murdering generals yeah. who ravaged the countryside, murdered people from ethnic minorities, uh, exacted terrible pogroms against the local population. And these were the people that the Bolsheviks were fighting in the Civil War. So if we're talking about these deaths at the hand of the revolution, I mean, that's, that's self-defense. Yeah. yeah, I think even, I think Churchill, there's a letter that Churchill writes to, must be one of the leaders of the the white army, the white terror, saying, you know, the reports of vicious anti-Semitic violence coming from, um, you know, se sections of the of the white army is making it harder for us yeah. to support you. Please, could You're you really making this a tough sell at home, guys? Yes. You're going to have to start uh, cleaning up your act. Yeah, and if if Churchill is trying to calm you down, then you've got some big problems, uh, probably. But no, you're you're making the right point, which is that this is a, a life or death moment for the for the Bolshevik state really. And it's precisely at this moment that a lot of the accusations of dictatorship and so mm. on come about. Because, as I was saying earlier, because the Bolsheviks and, and Lenin were going to do everything and anything that was necessary to defend the revolution and the workers' state, that meant they had to take certain measures, including banning um, the press and, and actors or anything that was attacking the government or that was not supporting the Bolsheviks in that moment. Because in allowing that to continue was giving, you know, was giving... Um... A political basis for the counter-revolution. Exactly, a political basis for the counter-revolution. And also, I mean, if any other government in the West, in the so-called enlightened democratic West, was yeah. faced with a civil war, do you think it would allow parties that openly supported the rebels <laughs> to join them in parliament? Do you think yeah. it would allow the supporters of the other side of a civil war to openly publish their propaganda in their newspapers <laughs> and distribute them within your, the territory the government control? Of course they wouldn't. Yeah. They, they would never... There's no way they would act according to the standards they set for Lenin and the Bolsheviks in the civil war in Russia. Yeah, exactly. And actually, um, it's easier for us now when we look back in hindsight, but we can say that the, the Bolsheviks should have acted much sooner in order to um, stop the promotion of some of this material, the promotion of, of, the, of the oppositionists kind of press was allowed all the way up until May 1918, you know, deep into the, the Civil War. And so in that context, again, the accusation of dictatorship is just ludicrous. And another popular example of Lenin and the Bolsheviks moving towards dictatorship was in the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly. And this is really interesting because the convening of a constituent assembly was a policy that the Bolsheviks pledged when they took power. So this is bas it's basically a bourgeois democratic formation. It's kind of like a bourgeois parliament on a slightly higher level. Mm. But by the time the constituent assembly was actually convened, you already have the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. Mm. You already had a higher form of government. 
Um, and it ended up stuffed with elements that, frankly, have been overtaken by history. It was stuffed with reformists, stuffed with liberals. It didn't have any support in the urban centres of Russia in particular, where the revolution was strongest. Mm. Um, it was completely surplus to history. And when it was dissolved, nobody cared. <laughs> yeah. It was only um, emigre counter-revolutionaries and so-called Democrats who wept any tears for the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly because the Bolsheviks were right. It it, it served no purpose in, in, in that moment. It had been superseded by history and mm. the Russian masses saw it shutter its doors with a shrug. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's noticeable. I'm just thinking about this textbook. <laughs> yeah. That this is something that the textbook highlights uh, as a moment rather than looking at, yeah, the Congress of Soviets, which for us, it's clear, was the highest expression of democracy um, one of the highest forms of democracy that can exist because it's act, it, it had the active participation of, of the workers and was elected by them, not just the workers, peasants were also elected onto Soviets in, in, in different parts of the country. Um, and so in every accusation of, of dictatorship um, that is launched at the Bolsheviks or the Bolshevik state, we can always point to a higher, truer expression of democracy in the form of, of actual workers' control and, and what the Congress of Soviets was, which was the basis for the Bolsheviks to take power take power in the first place, mm -hmm. uh, which is much more important. Um, yeah. And that leads us very neatly into the last myth we'll deal with today. Apologies if I didn't get around to the one you sent in. We haven't got much time to deal with these. Perhaps we'll return to a longer list uh, in a later episode. We'll bring Fiona back to debunk some more. But myth number three, Lenin laid the foundations for Stalin's rise to power. Yeah, this is an um, important question for us to answer. It's a question that any communist is going to get mm -hmm. <laughs> at any point in, in their journey is, you know, an explanation for, for Stalinism, especially because the, uh, the British state, the bourgeois in general, goes to a lot of effort to paint the two as the exact same thing. Um, but the foundation for Stalinism lies not in, in Lenin or even one man, but actually the conditions of the Soviet Union itself. Um, and this is absolutely vital for someone to understand. We can't explain the processes of the whole of the Soviet Union through the personalities of, of certain individuals. But actually in the, in the material conditions of the time, what do I mean by that? We've spoken a lot about the civil war that took place. And the civil war really devastated. R Russia was already quite a backward economy um, in, in, in terms of its, its resources, productive forces, and so on. But actually, the civil war devastated that even more so. And a lot of the bravest, most militant Bolshevik fighters had gone to the front in the civil war to fight for the Red Army. And a whole layer, if you will, if you want, of, of young, um, you know, important communists were killed in that process. And so a certain weariness had crept into the revolution, a tiredness, which meant that the economy was struggling to move forward, the, the whole revolution had been isolated. The revolutions that you had mentioned at the start of this that had erupted um, in different parts of the world had failed for various different reasons that we can't go into right now. Lenin had always said that the fate of the Soviet Union and the fate of the Russian Revolution was tied up in, in the world situation um, and was kind of, they were kind of waiting on these other revolutions to step forward in, in slightly more advanced countries such as Germany with economies that would have been able to inject into um, the, the Russian economy the necessary resources to materially improve conditions faster. But none of that had taken place. So weariness had, had crept in. And, and Stalin and the bureaucracy and this regime that began to emerge that was bureaucratic, it was holding things back, actually was a manifestation of, of that, of those conditions that I've just described. It doesn't in any way flow from Lenin as an individual. Obviously, the way that Stalin and Stalinism you know, went on to manifest itself in more repression um, and much more kind of conservative policies when it comes to divorce and abortion and the, and the things that we mentioned at the start that were real um, important advances at the beginning of the Soviet government. Um, all of that, again, was actually a reflection of the of the weakening of the Soviet Union and the economy and, and the, the literal resources that they had in order to continue to implement their program. Yeah, it's always interesting to me, this 
slander that Stalin is the natural continuation of Marxism and Leninism. Because, first of all, I don't think it's incorrect to say that Stalin, frankly, is a product of the counter-revolution that the bourgeois helped to foster. Mm. It was the strangulation of the Russian Revolution and the crushing of revolutionary movements throughout the world, the stagnation and the cutting off of the world revolution that isolated Russia, that allowed Stalin and the bureaucracy to take hold in the first place. Mm. So, as far as I'm concerned, it's a result of the the bourgeois uh, reaping what they sowed in ensuring that um, communism was not allowed to develop in, in Russia and develop internationally on a healthy basis. But also, we should ask, who were the first that Stalin turned his repression against? Who mm. were the first to be executed? Who were the first to be exiled, the first to be imprisoned? It was the opposition within the Bolshevik party. It mm-hmm. was Trotsky and the united and left opposition around him. Mm-hmm. Um, the entire 1917 Central Committee, so this was Lenin's Central Committee, the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party that led the revolution in the first place, mm-hmm. all but three, including Stalin, two non entities as well, were executed in Stalin's purges mm-hmm. or imprisoned and then died um stalin is not the continuation of lenin stalin was the grave digger of genuine leninism and genuine bolshevism and more to the point lenin towards the end of his life was fighting a battle with the bureaucracy in the party he saw where things were going he saw the effects of the new economic policy Mm -hmm. on the internal culture of the party he saw the results of having to pull expertise from the old czarist regime to mm-hmm. bolster the young Soviet state because of the level of backwardness in the country. He saw the careerism that was starting to creep in because obviously the Bolsheviks are in power now. So suddenly every two-bit greasy pole climber wants to have a go yeah. at involving themselves in the Soviet government. Lenin saw the danger and also specifically Stalin towards the end of his life. And Rob and Alan make this very clear in their book. He could see that Stalin was isolating him. I mean, Stalin ended up wheedling his way into being Lenin's main correspondent with the outside world when he was laid low with illness. Remember, Lenin had been shot by this point. He yes, had already we didn't that. been shot by Fanny Kaplan, yeah. the SR, um, and had yeah. had a series of strokes that rendered him increasingly unable to work, eventually unable to even speak. Um, but nevertheless, he could see what was happening. He saw that Stalin was trying to control his view of what was really going on. He kept mm. saying, look, stop giving me these censored and prettified reports. I want to know what's really happening in the country. Um, mm. He saw that Stalin was a danger. And uh, in his famous testament, his final testament, which Stalin tried to have repressed, or did have repressed, but is actually available to us today, he called for Stalin's removal mm-hmm. uh, because he could see the kind of character he was and he saw that he was becoming a kind of focal point of this counter-revolutionary bureaucracy or potentially counter-revolutionary bureaucracy. And he was trying to organize, in his words, a bomb, some kind of uh, bombshell uh, counter-offensive against Stalin and the bureaucrats at the 12th Party Congress. He was organizing with Trotsky to launch this at the Congress, but unfortunately he his health took a turn for the worse and he wasn't able to attend that Congress and he died shortly after in 1924. Mm. So Lenin's final struggle was against Stalinism Mm -hmm. or against the process and phenomenon that we now know as Stalinism. So Lenin himself certainly didn't see his ideas and the kind of ideas that he felt were distilled in the revolution as represented by Stalin and the bureaucrats. Quite the opposite. He saw those as a deadly threat. Yeah, what you said is really important for two reasons. One, it demonstrates that Stalin was the the human face of the bureaucracy. He was the, the human embodiment of the desires, the expressions, and just this force that had risen to a certain position in the party and then in in society as a whole. And and that's something that went on to have monstrous consequences um, in the years to come. But also that the bureaucracy had started to form actually when Lenin was still alive. As you say, in his final years and and, and the final year in particular in his life, he had begun a process against the bureaucracy 
And that then led him into direct confrontation with Stalin himself, who, as I said, was the, the human expression of this bureaucracy that was forming. Lenin was really concerned with the way that the committee men were developing in the party and the role that they were playing um, as a kind of smothering force, which is a really dangerous um, element to have in a party from the point of view of internal democracy, workers' control, and, and so on. And so, yeah, and that process had even begun whilst, whilst Lenin was still alive. And then unfortunately, when he died uh, in, in January 1924, um, Stalin immediately kind of began to accelerate his his this process of maintaining the the bureaucracy's position, and that meant that he then came into conflict with with Trotsky, who was the other main well leader of the Russian Revolution, leader of the Bolsheviks, um, but the main force who was trying to also curb what the bureaucracy was was doing and was beginning to to cement into place effectively. Um, and, and that's why it's, it's very clear to us that there's no natural direct line between Stalinism um, and Lenin and what Lenin really stood for. All right. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. There's plenty more in the way of slander and calumny that we could deal with. But yes. for now, I think that we should leave it there. This has been the second episode in our Lenin Lives series to coincide with the centenary of Lenin's death, as I said. I'll put links to the Lenin biography in the episode description. Please do get hold of a copy. It's fantastic, a real treasure trove. Not just an account of Lenin's personal history and political life, but also um, a really thorough treatment of his ideas, the development of his thought and the importance of the ideas that he upheld. So thoroughly recommended. Um, I'm going to end with a new segment that I haven't thought of a name for yet, but perhaps I will uh, come up with one by the next episode. <laughs> We've had loads of really inspiring messages from communists all over the world, and I wanted to read some out. These are young people in particular and radical workers who are looking to get involved with a communist organization. So this one is from mm -hmm. Montreal. The conflict in Gaza has politicized me, and despite it being a tough time for me personally, I wish to learn more, understand more about Marxism, Leninism, and communism. Well, comrade, you've come to the right organization. Mm -hmm. And this is from Switzerland. It's been translated from French, so bear with me. My French isn't very good. Uh, I have studied the political parties in Switzerland, and I believe that the ideas of communism will break down the barriers between poor people and savage capitalism. I will be delighted to be part of a party that is for the people and fight against all kinds of discrimination. I look forward to meeting you. Well, I'm happy to say that we organize in Switzerland. The Swiss comrades mm -hmm. are doing very well indeed. Absolutely. And they're about to launch, uh, or have already launched, I think, the Revolutionary Communist Party. And it's caused a bit of a stir in the <laughs> bourgeois press in Switzerland. Yes. So um, there is a communist party that you can and must join. Please do send in your messages via marxist.com. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear from new communists all over the world looking to get involved in the fight against capitalism, the fight to win socialism and communism in our lifetimes. Uh, if you enjoyed the episode, please do like, share and subscribe and <laughs> share. Don't laugh. Like, share and subscribe and share with the hashtag communism podcast. And also given the nature of the episode, the hashtag Lenin lives, which is what we're using to promote the year of Lenin campaign. That's all from me this week. I've been Joe for the Spectre of Communism. Fiona, one more time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Joe. And we'll see you all next week. <laughs> <laughs>